I believe so. Just okay. No, I think I got it. So it's, it's checking for mine, checking for yours. Good. And then go back and ask the audience. Audience, is it working? All right. They say it's good now. All right. Great. Oh, good. Well, Ooh. good. I'm glad you have an audience. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, me too. They, they helped me out significantly. Um, mm -hmm. So, Greg, thanks for coming on. I really appreciate you sure. taking the high time to have a conversation with me. Um, mm -hmm. Would you mind telling us a little bit about yourself before we get started? Oh, okay. Yeah. My name is Greg Gansall. I teach philosophy at Talbot School of Theology. Been here about five years. Um, mostly do philosophy of religion, some history of philosophy. I uh, did my PhD at Syracuse, where I worked with uh, William Alston. He was my advisor, which was great fun. And um, I don't know what else. That's that's kind of the story. All right, cool. I actually I'm really interested in William Alston and his work on a few things. But uh, let's just jump right in. So I'm an atheist, by which I mean I believe there are no reasons to believe in the existence of God. And could you tell me? What reasons you believe there are for belief in a God? And then I'd like to tell you my position on those reasons. And then I'd just like to hear your thoughts yeah. on my position. Well, well, uh, when you emailed and said that you thought there was no evidence for the existence of God, I thought, I wonder what you mean by evidence. So I'd love to hear more what you're talking about, because it, it strikes me as, as odd that you would think there's no ev evidence whatsoever. So what do you mean by evidence? So by evidence, I mean something that indicates the thing exists more than the thing does not exist. So for example, if we say there are leprechauns and we wanted evidence of leprechauns, the evidence would have to show or make it more likely that leprechauns, leprechauns exist than they don't exist. And for, yeah. You know, okay. So for example, if I said, I imagine leprechauns, well, that wouldn't be evidence that they actually exist because it doesn't right. give us a way to differentiate them existing from them not existing. Okay. Okay. Well, fair enough. So, so some fact counts as evidence for a theory if given the fact the theory is more likely then the theory is without the fact right right, right. More, more likely that the thing that we're arguing for exists than does not exist well actually that's not true right how so because because it would evidence uh makes a a, a theory more likely than the theory would be without the evidence so if it raises the likelihood at all it counts as evidence in some sense. And then um, and then if you can turn the probability upside down, then you say the explanatory power of the theory is does the theory make the fact or evidence um, more likely than if the theory were false? It doesn't have to become decisive to count as evidence. All right, absolutely. So I'm saying by any percentage point, so if it raises the likelihood of it being true by 1%, like 51, 49, that does right. count as evidence. But I would say it has to show that the thing exists as opposed to not exist, because if the evidence indicates it exists and indicates it does not exist equally, that would then be not evidence for the conclusion. For example, if I said um, there could be evidence for God, like the cosmological argument, but that cosmological argument could equally work for a non-God, like a multiverse or something. Well, that evidence works equally as well for a God as it does for a non-God, which means it wouldn't exactly be evidence of a God. It wouldn't indicate a God any more than a non-God. Right, but you think, okay, so the, the fact, we're still talking about evidence, not the argument. Mm -hmm. The fact that you've got some kind of cosmological argument, uh, although a multiverse is not relevant to that, so we're really talking about a design argument. Um, the fact we've got a, a, a design argument, um, even if the multiverse is a possibility, it raises the likelihood of the theory that a God exists. It might not raise it above the theory that there is no God, but it raises it um, some percentage points over what it would have been without the evidence. So right, for so example, you, you find fingerprints on a gun and raises the likelihood that the person whose fingerprints are guilty, even if the total case goes the other way. Right. So in that case, I would not consider that to be evidence of a God because it also works for a non-God. Since the options are either God yeah. or no God, since it works equally as well That's for both. An idiosyncratic view of evidence, I think. Well, you could, you could still count that as evidence in some sense, but it isn't evidence of a God as opposed to a non-God. It doesn't, as you said, well, it doesn't dis distinguish between the two. It's evidence for the theory that God exists, even, well, even if it might not raise the total probability of that theory 
um, above some competing theory. Right. Because so the total you, probability uh, depends on every all the lines of evidence. Right. So from my perspective, it doesn't count as evidence unless it can actually show that it's more likely than the competing theories. Okay. Well, okay. That's just you're you're using evidence different than you would in Bayes' theorem or in scientific confirmation or something like that. So then I think, well, I don't know why you have that view. That's not the view that philosophers have or or people who do philosophy of science. So, um, oh, from my view, because it's like it's pretty intuitive. It's like if we have a box and we don't know what's in the box and we know the box weighs two pounds and you said there's a rabbit in the box. Well, is the two mm -hmm. pounds evidence of a rabbit? No, it's just evidence that there's something in the box. Could it be a rabbit? Sure, but the fact that it could be a rabbit doesn't mean we should right. believe it's a rabbit. So coming to the conclusion it's a rabbit is unreasonable based off the fact the box weighs two pounds right. because it could be a lizard or a coffee mug or any number of other things. And I see the existence right. of God kind of like the same thing. All of the evidence okay. for God is like the two-pound box. It can be explained by infinitely many things. So the probability of God being right. true is essentially zero because it can be explained by lots of different things. And so if all of the evidence yeah, can okay, that's kind by of... a non-God as well as a God, then there isn't any evidence to indicate mm -hmm. a God. Okay, so let's take let's look at it this way. Let's take two situations. I don't want to call them possible worlds because I don't want to assume anything about the possibility of the situations. They're epistemically possible, whether or not they're metaphysically possible. Situation A, all we know about it is there's no God. Okay, we don't know if there's a universe. We don't know if anything exists. Right. Situation B, all we know is that a relatively minimalistic concept of God exists. Right. God is unlimited in power, knowledge, holy good. And if something else exists, um, God created those things. Right. That's the kind of minimalistic theism you get with the problem of evil, William Rowe and Paul Draper and these guys who were excellent philosophers. Um, so when you're comparing those two situations, which one has the explanatory resources to explain why there is a universe at all? Well, situation A, the fact that there's no God has no explanatory resources to explain the universe. Situation B has sufficient explanatory resources. And therefore, the bare existence of a universe turns out to be evidence that situation B holds and not situation A. Right. So what I would say that just this first situation you said where there is no God doesn't say anything about what is or isn't in that universe. So there could still be something Definitely. in that universe, which is a non-God, sure. which could explain the universe, the existence of the universe. But but there's no explanation for the existence of the universe that that atheism actually provides. Well, correct. Atheism just says we have no reason to believe in a God. I take the more weaker position of atheism. That doesn't mean there couldn't be other things. There could always be something else there. Like right. most atheists believe just some kind of nature is eternal or nature has always been there. And that is ex that explains the origin of the universe. So what we do still you mean have, by nature? What do I mean by nature? Mm -hmm. I would just attribute something like all, eternal, all-powerful, but no consciousness to just natural something we don't know about yet. Wait a minute. Eternal? You mean like everlasting? No well, beginning. Eternal can mean or several you mean different eternal things. Like essentially, temporal. It could be either one. I'm open to either possibility there. So okay. but I would just say it could be outside of space of time, throughout all of time, uh, one of the multiple dimension okay. theories of time, and then all powerful just meaning it has infinite power to do whatever, whatever is logically possible or mm -hmm. whatever. Okay. And but not conscious. Correct. Not conscious. Right. And so uh, what what's the evidence for that? Um, well, I would just use all of the same arguments theism do, does and say that this thing can explain all of those arguments equally as well as theism. So like the cosmological mm -hmm. argument, the universe began to exist, or any, everything that begins to exist has a cause, the universe began to exist, the universe has a cause. That cause has to be something outside of whatever the natural known stuff is. And so we can say, okay, mm -hmm. there's just an unknown mm -hmm. natural thing, which is the necessary thing to solve the contingency argument. So just like a god solves the contingency argument, we could just solve it with an unknown natural thing. Well, if if... Suppose, suppose this thing exists and it's not an agent, as you say. Um, um, well, for, first of all, let me ask you this before I get into that. Is this what you believe is real or is this just a, a possibility to kind of raise as an objection to certain theistic arguments? Right. I just use it to raise as an objection. I think that we don't okay. know what the fundamental nature of reality is, but I think that all the arguments that are used to indicate theism can work equally as well for a non-God okay. or a non-conscious thing. Kind of like the rabbit in the box example. It could be explained by a rabbit or it could be explained by a lizard, which means it right. doesn't actually indicate the rabbit over the lizard. 
And so yeah. I think that well, a non-conscious thing works equally as well as a conscious God thing to explain everything. Well, suppo well suppose the universe came into existence, right? Like a lot of people think. Um, it seems like that tilts the evidential scale towards something conscious, an agent who brings things into being for reasons, because that, that gives an explanation for why is the universe as old as it is? Why was it triggered when it was triggered, right? If you've got this everlasting non-conscious thing, then all the sufficient conditions for the beginning of the universe are there everlastingly, and you would expect an everlasting universe. But if, if the universe came into existence, and of course, we could argue about whether that's true. Um, if the universe came into existence, then it seems like you need a conscious agent who can decide to bring things into existence. So the, the scale gets tipped towards agency at that point. Right. I would just reject that argument and say it's equally as plausible to say that there's some kind of quantum fluctuation that just causes it to appear at one point in time as opposed to another. And that can but, uh, equally explain why the universe came into existence uh, 13.8 billion years ago, as opposed to any other time as a conscious action. So it, it still has reasons, determined reasons or random reasons that are natural mm -hmm. in nature mm -hmm. without consciousness. So it seems to me that both could explain why the universe began at a particular time right. equally as well. Mm -hmm. I don't see why that would okay. tip the scales. So, so how do you explain the existence of this being? Does nature, whatever it is, is it a necessarily existing thing? Yes, I would say so. Just like you would say that. God Metaphysical would be, necessity. Yes. Right. On what basis? Uh, on what basis do you say that God is a necessarily existing being? Because if, if God is real, then ev everything other than God depends on God for his existence. So there's no way the world could be such that God wouldn't exist. I would just say the same thing about my nature, and I'd call it naturalistic pantheism, and just say the same thing about naturalistic pantheism. Okay, let me think about that for a second. That's a naturalistic pantheism. Be right, so every, everything we see around us is part of God. Well, to be more like specific, that. I'm using the definition used in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, which is just uh, a natural world, essentially, just eternal, all powerful, just nature is everything. And that's explained. There's no consciousness, and you can just call that divine if you want. So it's the specific definition is something like um, it only entails ontological commitments of science or something like that. So nothing beyond the realm of what science mm -hmm, deems, mm -hmm. so natural, materialistic stuff. So, so why did, where did consciousness come from? Uh, emergent property from naturalist materialistic stuff. This seems unlikely. There are lots of things that are unlikely, but that doesn't mean it's impossible. or. Uh, well, I'm not happen. arguing it's impossible. I'm arguing that it's more likely that consciousness, finite consciousness, comes from a uh, necessarily existing conscious being than that it is a uh, random emergent event. How so? Because th there's a, an explanatory source for consciousness. I mean, consciousness is the hard problem, as you know. Right, but I could say the same thing about anything. I could say, well, why do we have black holes? Well, I mean, it could, it could be that black holes came about by random physical forces, or it could be that there's just the, the fundamental nature of reality has the essence of black holes in it, or it's just, it is a black hole or something. I could just take any property that we see in the world and say, oh, this property mm -hmm. is just fundamental to the necessary thing that is the basis of everything. Or it could just hmm. be an emergent property. So it seems like we could apply that same reasoning to just anything in the world. Do you have any story of emergence that makes sense of this? Uh, what do you mean? Emergence? I, 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 it's unclear to me how consciousness can emerge from neural firings or something like that. Oh, no, I have not solved the hard problem of consciousness. Not yet. I'm working on it. Okay. All right. But that it would kind just of a be... leap of faith on your part, right? Uh, well, I'd say it's an inductive argument since everything else we've discovered so far has a natural explanation. It's reasonable to conclude that the next unknown thing is also probably going to have a natural explanation. Well, see, I think you can't make that argument because all you have is that you speculate that things have a natural explanation because there are two alternative theories. And all you have said is that evidence will support either theory equal way. So you can't say that we've actually discovered the existence of the universe has a natural explanation you believe it does oh, you right. don't you haven't discovered that it is so there is no inductive argument well i can't say that the natural thing does definitively explain consciousness that's unknown but i can say that all the other things we've discovered can be explained naturally like gravity lightning 
fairy circles, uh, biology, all of those kinds of things, the development of the eye, all of those have naturalistic explanations. So I can mm -hmm. say, given the fact that every time in the past we've said this could be a supernatural explanation, we've later discovered, nope, it was just a natural explanation. If we like see natural explanation, natural explanation, natural explanation, the next blank is probably mm -hmm. inductively we conclude it's also probably going to be a natural explanation. We don't know yet. I can't conclude it for certain, but it's more reasonable mm -hmm. to conclude natural than an unknown supernatural thing, which has never been seen before. Well, well, never been seen. You're 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 loading. All right, that's the thing that's my presupposition. Yeah. So you're an empiricist. You think everything's got to be seen? Uh, no. I would say that you need some way to differentiate between our imagination and reality, because we have to show is something that we're asserting to exist something that actually does exist, or is it a part of our mm -hmm. imagination? And my way, the the way that I know that successfully differentiates between these two is science. So I would not say that all things need to be demonstrated in that way, because there are many things that are imaginary or conceptual, like math and logic and feelings and emotions and all those kinds of things, which may not be... Wait a minute, Ma math is imaginary? Conceptual, yeah, it's a part of our head. It's uh, what we use to describe reality. So are mathematical truths necessary truths? Um, I assume they're necessary, I, but they may not be, like because there are different kinds of non-standard math, or to quote, what's his name? Uh, David Chalmers. He said, mm -hmm. it's possible that there is such a thing as impossible universes where two plus two equals five, like... I don't know. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, uh, okay. I mean, I think Mill had a, had a view like this. I think he thought, uh, mathematics was an empirical generalization from what I understand, but, um, it, uh, it, it, it renders a mathematical physics physics difficult, um, to think math is contingent. I'm not saying you're saying it's contingent, but, right. but you were putting mathematics in the imaginary, like also emotions. Well, emotions are real. Oh, right, right. So I didn't mean it in that way. I'm, I'm happy to grant that math is necessary. We can grant that. That's fine. But I wouldn't okay. say they are exist. Math doesn't exist as a part of the world. You can't discover numbers out there anywhere. There are conceptual right. things. It's a formal language that we use to describe reality. It isn't a fundamental okay. part of reality. Right. What are the truth makers for mathematical truths? Well, truth is a property of sentences. So whether or not. Well, math a mathematical truth is a sentence. One plus one equals two. Right. What's the truth maker? Uh, definitionally, we define okay, it as fair such. Enough. Yeah, got it. All right, just getting getting some things clear. Um, so when you call something in a part of the imagination, you don't mean it doesn't exist. Uh, I'm saying the emotion you you put in the imagination and they exist. Right. Uh, I'm saying like, is it something that's a part of the world independent of our minds, or is it a part of our minds? Like emotions don't like there isn't like okay. A, All right. Fair, fair enough. Um, it's actually helpful for me. Um, so I'm trying to think where the train of thought got derailed here. Um, you, you were trying to make a distinction between um, the methods of science as telling us about reality. And you wanted to say that you don't think the methods of science are the only way to know things. And that's where you made this distinction between imagination, which I kind of interrupted you in. Right. So is that fair? Or? Yeah. So I, there are different categories of things. Uh, science is how we differentiate between the conceptual things and the empirical experiential things. Numbers are not ex mm -hmm. empirical experiential. We can't experience right. numbers. They are conceptual. They are something that is a formal language in our mm -hmm. mind, as far as we can tell, but they're right. not of the experiential kind of things. Mm -hmm. So we need some way to differentiate between the conceptual kinds of things and the empirical kinds of things. And that's, I use science to do that, but it's not the only way to know things. That's all. It does right. Are there, are there other empirical things that aren't scientific? Um, possibly things that we haven't discovered yet. Sure. Well, like what about history? The uh, methods of history are empirical. Correct. Well, most of history, as I would say, has an empirical basis, an implicit empirical basis. Like if I said, right. if I said I saw a dog, dogs have an empirical basis, even though my testimony that, that I saw one doesn't implicit, doesn't explicitly say here's the empirical evidence of dogs. Okay. So I right. say history is, it's reasonable to believe pretty much all of the claims of history that already have an implicit empirical basis, like Lincoln was shot in the theater or right. the sun goes, or the earth goes around the sun or whatever. But I wouldn't believe things like miracles or magic or mythical creatures, those kinds of things, because they don't have an empirical basis. It would well, not some be reasonable. Of them. Uh, I mean, if someone was an eyewitness to a miracle then, or an eyewitness to a leprechaun, 
you would have to investigate those claims in the same way. Right. Oh, you right. Can't pre would... You can't prejudge the claim. Oh, absolutely. So I would say that we would need some kind of repeatable, testable way to verify it rather than just the testimony alone well, wouldn't be sufficient. Why would it be re repeatable? Why would it have to be repeatable? Uh, because it could just be a delusion or an illusion. The fact that it well, can't like we like we need some way to differentiate between is it imaginary or is it mm -hmm. real? And one of right. the ways we do that is, is it testable, repeatable? Because if it's not testable, repeatable, then there's no way to differentiate it between is it imaginary thing or is it a real thing? Because See, but that's not true either, because the beginning of the universe would, is a non-repeatable. Right, but it makes predictions, and the predictions are repeatable. Oh, well, that's different than repeatable. <laughs> okay, you change your story here, which is okay, right? We're just trying to clarify. Well, what do you mean? I, that's the same thing, like making predictions testable or repeatable. I didn't mean the event itself was repeatable. I meant it makes okay, predictions okay. that are repeatable. Okay, so so it makes predictions. Well, you know, I don't know if that I don't know if you can rule that out from certain miracles, but but oh yeah, if it makes if if miracles make predictions, then I am happy to grant them. Like if you can, mm -hmm. I'm told that's evidence. Absolutely counts as evidence. Okay, well, all right, I'll tell uh, I'll tell a Christian story then. All right, here's a miracle. Jesus was raised from the dead physically, and one of the predictions it makes is that people who come to entrust their lives to Jesus have a transformed life. That's a prediction, and it's a prediction that's been verified. Absolutely. So at, at least in at least in theory, it satisfies. Right. Well, I can make the prediction that the spaghetti monster exists, therefore the sun will rise tomorrow. The fact that the sun will rise tomorrow isn't ex evidence of the spaghetti monster existing. It's just something we already know happens. So I would put that in that kind of class. Of right. Predictions. Right. But the spaghetti monster existing is not the is not you're not testing a, a miracle claim in the same way. Right. So well, that's what I meant. the sun rising tomorrow is not an intrinsic part of that story. Right. That's what I meant, is that when you say people's lives are transformed, people's lives are transformed by lots and lots and lots of different things. Sure. Sure. So, I'm not saying the only way people's lives are transformed. Right. So from, from my experience, it's just another thing we know happens, like the sun rising tomorrow. So the fact that it happens isn't really much of a okay. prediction. Right. I'm not very persuaded by that. I don't think... I don't, I would say uh, you would need novel prediction, something new that we don't we don't already know is going to happen. Well, then the spaghetti monster story doesn't work either. Right, right. That was the point. Okay. Neither of those work. Okay. All right. Um, all right. Here, here's another prediction. Um, Jesus rose from the dead, and the, and an intrinsic prediction is that the tomb is empty. Right. Well, that's a unique prediction. Right. And it, it, it was verified. And so you've got a intrinsic prediction of a miracle story that is empirical and testable. And now our access to that is obviously through historical methodologies, um, just like the Lincoln assassination, um, which was a unique thing that had pred um, intrinsic predictions that we can verify. All right, but I, again, I would go with an empty tomb is explained in lots and lots of different ways. And I would prefer a natural explanation that we already have lots of evidence for than a supernatural one that we have no other examples well, for. Well, if, if, I mean, if, if you read like Mike Lacona's book on the historiography of the resurrection, he does a good job laying out the different naturalistic views. I mean, if you've got a, if, if you've got a, um, a prejudice towards the naturalistic, then th that goes way beyond the evidence. That, well, then you're not going to see it that way. But you've got to at least grant that it's a it's a legitimate um, verification of a theory. I'm actually a big fan of Mike Lacona. One of my favorite quotes of his is from his paper, Historians and Miracle Claims. It's the first line. It says, most biblical scholars and historians hold to it that the study of miracle claims lies outside of the bounds of a historian acting within their professional capacity. Mm -hmm. um, essentially, History testimony can't verify things that don't already have an empirical basis. So the resurrection but, itself would have to be, we'd have to have examples of resurrection today that we can use testable predictions for in order to be able to reasonably infer that it happened in the past. For, and this is the case for all miracles, magic, mythical creatures, the paranormal, supernatural, UFOs, anything that doesn't well, have an empirical basis. We would that's need the case one. for all historical events, right? No, I mean, I, how many Lincoln assassinations are there? All right, but we have examples of people with guns, of theaters, of people dying, of presidential mm -hmm. assassinations. All of that has an empirical basis. Right, so so when the first president was shot, we couldn't make any predictions from that because we didn't have enough presidents being shot. We had people being shot and guns. Okay, and when the first person was shot. 
Right, and was, until if the first until gun was three invented, people are shot, we can't reason about people being shot. Right, so if the first gun was invented and someone was shot and they brought it to a court case, they'd be like, we have no precedent for this. Like, we have no idea how that occurred. It would be exactly like magic. We would need more well, examples. No, now you're talking about legal precedent, right? Well, I about consider them the what same. What are the rules about gunshots, right? I'm, I'm talking about epistemic. Uh, you know, no, you're saying no singular event can can be um, encountered empirically or Correct. have any evidence for it. Correct. And I was using the court case as an example there, but it's the same point overall. It's like if someone cast a spell to kill someone and it would not be reasonable to believe it. If there was the first spell ever and it was cast mm -hmm. and someone was killed with the spell, right. it would not be reasonable to believe it. And guns are the same thing. First gun was invented. Gun was used to shoot somebody. It's exactly like a spell. Like, um, oh, that's Arthur really C. interesting. The Arthur C. Clarke, Clarke quote. Um, some technology is indistinguishable from magic, something. Oh, sure. So it's the I don't same know kind of thing. what the quote is, but yeah, I mean. So, so the same kind of thing. The first gunshot ever, since no one ever knew what guns were, it would be unreasonable to believe that it happened until we could actually verify how guns work and that they were actually a potential candidate for this and we could repeatedly test the explosion and the projectile <laughs> thing. Until we got that, it would not be reasonable to believe okay. somebody was shot. All right, that's an interesting view. I don't think I've ever encountered that view. I'm, I have to think about it. I don't think you're right, but you know, it's plenty fun to talk about. Yeah. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, I don't know where you want to go from here. I mean, we're, we're having a good exchange. Yeah. And just uh, any, any other arguments or evidence you think are indicative of the existence of God? Well, I, like I said, I think the beginning of the universe is because I think it's better. See what you want for evidence is, is an inference to the best explanation, right? You, you want to say, look, it, there are certain things that are explained better by the existence of God than a naturalistic alternative, even if the naturalistic alternative is possible. Right. All right I think absolutely. Consciousness is one of these things. Um, I think objective moral obligations is one of these. I'm not talking about objective moral goods. I think we can have objective moral goods like human flourishing without, um, without God. But I think obligations are better explained. It might not be impossible without God, but it, they're better explained by the existence of a God that has a, a nature that's good and made us for purposes, some of which are moral. Um, I think, um, what did I say? Consciousness. I think uh, libertarian freedom is explained better by the existence of God. And so all of these things count as some degree of evidence. I'm not arguing that they're conclusive and that, that they need to change somebody's mind. Because persuasion is person relative and it has to do with a lot of other things going on. But I think these certainly count as evidence. All right, absolutely. And I'm going to try and argue that they can be explained. Like, like you said, you're trying to argue for the inference to the best explanation. And I want to show that the naturalistic explanations are just as good, if not better, than the theistic ones. That's my goal. So okay. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not arguing that you need proof. I just want to say they're exactly right. the same explanatory power. Explanatory Start with power. obligation. All right, so obligation. Morality could be an undiscovered natural law that we haven't, we don't know about yet. That's not an explanation. That's just a, that's an appeal to, to the inside of a black box, right? How is that different from the appeal to a god? Because the the appeal to the god actually has the content that um, well, two things. It has the content that it can explain objective moral obligations, and. Uh, the appeal to God is embedded in other evidential stories. So it's not an ad hoc hypothesis like the one you just brought up. Okay, so regarding the second case, I would say that all of the other evidential cases can also equally be explained by naturalistic pantheism, the argument, um, the natural thing. So I would yeah. say that that case I can explain. And the second case you said, well, but God do, has the... Does it explain it better? I would say I can make it explain it equally as well in every case for every argument. So there isn't a... You can't appeal to the... The interest okay, objective moral obligations on naturalistic pantheism, where right. there's no consciousness, so no preference between good and evil. Explain how naturalistic pantheism explains those. Undiscovered law of nature like gravity that just permeates the universe. It's just a problem. How do you get an nature? obligation from that? Because a, a physical law doesn't tell us what we ought to do as if we have choices. It tells us what happens. Well, how do you get an obligation from God's view of morality? Because God has the authority to prescribe obligations. Uh, let me put it this way. Does God say something is good 
is it this good because God says so, or does God say so because it's good for some other reason? Right, that's dilemma. the Euthyphro dilemma, right? Which was solved a million years ago. What's the after Euthyphro? Well, the answer is that neither, right? Which is, is that God, God's, God's commands do not invent goodness, but God command God's goodness is um, affiliated or a reflection of the nature of God as being wholly good. Right. And then his commands are what can impose obligation. So, right. so, so you split the grounds of moral goodness from the grounds of moral obligation, which has been done throughout the history of philosophy. You probably read Bob Adams on this. and yeah. Right. So, so I'm going to use those exact same answers and say that it's the nature of naturalistic pantheism that grounds the goodness and the oughtness comes from the undiscovered law like gravity, which is give, gives us the oughtness just like God's commands does. But how does, an, how does a natural law give obligation? This, how does God's commands give obligation? Because, because, because God has the authority to command that we ought to behave in certain ways. Laws of nature just describe the way things behave. There's no oughtness to it. Well, I would say the same thing. If God can have some property that gives us gives oughtness and authority, then the same thing can apply to a naturalistic thing. There's no need for consciousness there. No, there's this. absolutely. How, how does the naturalistic um, blob or whatever that is, I, I don't know what name you want to give this thing. Um, how does nature prescribe an obligation that has content? It's a reflection of its nature, just like you would say that it's a reflection of God's nature. Well, that, that might describe goodness, right? But goodness itself is not enough to get obligation. Um, how so? I see them as synonymous. If it's if it's all no, no more. more. So, so you, I mean, we can go to Aristotle and get a good case that uh, human flourishing is an objective moral good. Okay, but but how do you get that? I am obligated to help contribute to other people's human flourishing. Well, doesn't the fact that it means it's an objective moral good mean it is therefore ought to be the case? It has oughtness. Isn't that what it means to be an objective moral good? What's the difference? I, I, I don't think so. I think it's so, for example, the 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 phenomena of super irrigation seems to cut in this. So, you know, it's a, it's a moral good uh, to use one of Bill Austin's examples for me to make sure that all the children in some village get piano lessons. I mean, that's a more it's a morally good thing because it's connected with their development, their flourishing. But there but the fact that that's a good it in no way entails that it's an obligation on my part. So we can we can see that the concept of moral goodness and the concept of moral obligation um, are not synonymous. Right. But I would just consider that like uh, the difference between an amoral and moral action. Like It would be moral to do certain things, but the fact that it's. Like, the f I don't understand how that connects to your commands give odds. I don't see how that relates. Okay, all right. Well, that's a, that's a different thing. I just want to first make the distinction um, between between a moral good and a moral obligation. But you just said it's not a moral good, right? The, helping these children flourish in this way, it doesn't count as a moral good. Well, I would say it would be a moral action to do so, but like not morally permissible. Be, yes. Right. But it would, but not helping wouldn't be immoral. It would be amoral. But it would increase the moral good in the world. Uh, well, I mean, all everything else being equal. Sort of, yeah. I mean, I don't really consider piano lessons a moral good, but yes. Well, well, human flourishing. You know, you, you, developing musical talent in people. I mean, right. We just go with that. I don't. I don't consider human flourishing. I think choice is more important. But essentially, but it doesn't. It's unimportant to the example. So. So okay. a, I right. grant that there's a difference between there. You can do there is moral things you can do without being obligated because you're it's not doing them as amoral. It's not immoral not to do. Them. No, it's not immoral. Right. It's amoral because you're not under an obligation. Right. But if you were to do them, you would be increasing the, the moral goodness in the world. Right. So therefore, moral goodness and moral obligation are distinct. All right. And, so, and to impose an obligation, you have to have authority. And then you have to um, have, I think, and I, I'm thinking this speculative right now, a, a, an act of pr prescribing right, and saying, okay, this, con this is the moral um, imperative, right? And, uh, and that's why you need to have authority, right? Which God has in virtue of creating us for his own reasons. I but your, na your nature thing doesn't have any of that.
I don't see any connection between the authority and how that gives you oughtness. It seems like an arbitrary connection there. Well, well, if I tell if I tell you you've got an obligation to send me a hundred bucks, I have no authorities, right? So you so you really have no obligation. <laughs> well, I mean, I'd see. So I you go can see my commands have no have no traction for your life. Well, I'd say it's like um, authority isn't a real thing. It's an imaginary relationship we have in our mind. It's not a function of reality. So I'd say that you've created this. Well, uh, I forget what it's there called. Are, there's real client. authority, right? There's real. I mean, moral obligations have authority. Oh, this is where I don't think I would agree with you. I think authority is a made up property kind of like tallness. It's just a human association we have between things. I don't think it's a fundamental part of reality. Well, it might be a relational property, right? Someone has authority in some sphere over someone else. I, I mean, that's, but, it, but that doesn't mean it's a made up property just because it's relational, like, like tallness. It's a relational property. Right. But I would say there isn't some essence of tallness that's a part of the universe. There's not uh, an embodiment of true tallness out there. Sure. Now you're going Platonist, right? Which is okay. Well, I mean, right? is that, just, isn't that what you're arguing? You're saying that this authority thing is some fundamental part of reality and that it's intrinsic in this God thing, right? Isn't that? Well, it's in it. God has authority in virtue of um, his role as creator. Well, couldn't I just say the same thing of pantheism? Pantheism is the ultimate necessary creator. But there is, pantheism isn't a creator, right? I mean, there might be a causal relation between your pantheistic thing and the subsequent universe or... I don't I don't want to specify the relation between these, though, but there might be a causal relation, but it's not a creating relation where where there's causation with a purpose. Right. So creation is causing something to come into being. For reasons. Right. So if I spill my coffee and it makes a stain. I might say, hey, look at the stain I created, but I'm using that term kind of idiosyncratically, whereas if I write a poem right i create which i can't right but if i could uh i'm creating something because i'm making it for a reason well i'd say and purpose this is what your naturalistic thing can't do or i'd say purpose is the same thing as authority it's just a made-up property kind of like tallness there's no you keep appealing to things that seem to be imaginary relations in our head but aren't fundamental parts of reality and you can and you're like calling mm -hmm. them fundamental parts of reality well i don't know if i'm calling them fundamental parts of reality the way you think right i'm not I'm not saying that that authority is an empirical object, right? But it doesn't mean it's not real, right? So, so your empiricism is getting going to get you in trouble on more on morality. You're going to wind up like David Hume or Nietzsche, who actually winds up exactly like Hume, I think. Well, I actually believe in objective morality, but I consider it more like of a synthetic a priori kind of thing, like Kant. So it's not. Mm -hmm. I don't actually need the empiricism for that. But it seems to me. So you're not an empiricist if you have this that a priori. Oh, right, I'm not an empiricist. Okay, okay, I, right, I that's helpful for me. So I, w I won't call you one from now on. Okay, yeah. <laughs> okay. So, so again, from my viewpoint, it seems that you've taken, um, I forget what it's called, when you apply uh, emotional human properties to non to material things. Anthropomorphic. It's not ex specifically. There's a specific kind of word for it, but I forget what it's called. Okay. But All it's, right. the, these things that you're applying, like uh, authority and purpose, seem to me nothing more than figments of our imagination that we apply to things like English words, like the word tree. There's no such thing as the word tree. It's not true. It's not a part of reality. It's just an English well, word that we use to describe wait, things. Wait a, wait, wait a minute. You can't say there's no such thing as the word tree. Like it, as a part of the universe independent of our minds. A reality. Well, if you write it on, on a piece of paper... The, the word exists. It's a physically instantiated, right? Words are universals. Um, what? Words, words are, universal? are universal. So then, a how universal. We, so how do we change them and disagree about them? Well, we disagree about universals all the time, like obligation or moral goodness or uh, beauty, right? I mean, you know, if you take a, a if if you're going to move into Platonism, which is you know fair, a fair view. Um, well, I would say I'm not a Platonist. I would say that you seem to be arguing for Platonism, that there are these abstract concepts that are actually existing things. And I, I would disagree with that. I'd say that's unsupported. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, like words, I feel for like example. I have to argue for Platonism. I just keep thinking you're, you keep dipping your hand in Platonism to solve a problem that you can't have, that you can't solve. Um, 
Oh, you mean for the like the, the moral moral object thing? Yeah, sort of. yeah. As so, a, I'm, 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 okay, go on. I'm sorry, I cut you off. Well, I mean, remember I mentioned at the beginning, this isn't something I actually believe. This is just a counter argument to theism. Right. Well, tell well, me what you actually believe. What well, I right? believe is that I'm, we, not, I'm not interested in the theories, right? Because well, you're yeah. asking me what I believe, right? So my position is that we don't know anything about the fundamental nature of reality. Could be a God, could be not a God, could be a just eternal, a powerful nature mm -hmm. thing. Any of those, like a deism thing, polytheism, transtheism, right. henotheism, there's a bunch of different possibilities. Any of those could be sure. true. We have no reason to believe any of them over the others. They can all explain everything. And those are two different claims, right? We don't know anything about them, and we have no reason to believe any of them. Because I was going to ask, well, are, are some of these more reasonable than others, given mm -hmm. the things we do know? Uh, yes, possibly. Like, for example, there are certain ones that I'd see have, having contradictions. Like, for example, Christian theism, I see as having lots of contradictions, so I see it mm -hmm. as less plausible in many ways. Well, if it has contradictions, then it's extremely less plausible. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'll go with that. Right. But when it, but you're thinking in terms of um, an evidential case, so, a, apart from incoherence, internal incoherence. Right. So there's like, no for example, evidential case for one thing over another. Yeah, as far as I can tell, they can all explain like the cosmological argument, the teleological argument, the ontological argument, um, all of those different arguments that are presented in order to support theism can work equally as well to support all of these things. You just have to employ mm -hmm. the same kinds of reasoning to change yeah. the definition of whatever God you're arguing for. Well, I, I think I pointed out a couple of places where I don't think that's true, right, in terms of objective moral obligations and the beginning of the universe. Right now, you you appeal to quantum fluctuation. I, I I don't know what to think about that. I think people use that word a lot of times when they don't. I mean, it's it's like multiverse. People have been infected. I'm not saying this about you, but in general, people are infected by science fiction, and and these terms have lost a lot of the traction. Well, uh, my understanding is is in the physics, the theory of how the universe came into existence was a quantum fluctuation, like uh, virtual particles popping in and out of existence. It's that's literally the same process, hypothetically mm -hmm. from the theories. Right. But, so they pop into existence out of something. Right. right. Yes. Then the, that's not the beginning of the universe. Well, that is it's the beginning of the Big Bang, which is okay. The universe. Fair enough. In but, physics, but... the universe only applies to our universe, our space, and right. our time, not all things. Right. So there's no evidence that all things had a beginning, only evidence that our physical right. universe had a beginning. If, if past time can be infinite, maybe you can have a theory that things always existed. Well, not even in that case, because there are different kinds of time. There's like multiple right. dimensions of time. Which Metaphysical like, time. Um, as opposed to, you know. No, I'm talking about physics time. Like there's two time physics from uh, Itzel Bars and... Mm -hmm. imaginary time from Stephen Hawking and emergent mm -hmm. space time where space and time emerge from some more fundamental natural properties, right. which is right. Sean Carroll and Nima or Connie Hamad. But, so, but clearly physics time is not the most fundamental time. Oh, right. Nothing in science doesn't say anything about the most fundamental. It's just as far right. as we can right. tell. Yeah. That's why I was thinking metaphysical time, right? Because if you posit that this thing occurred before the big bang, then, whatever temporal properties it had was not tied to physical time. Right, right. So right. yeah, okay. you'd have to be in reference to some kind of metaphysical time, whatever that means. Right. Yeah, that's what I was, that's what I was going for, right, the right. metaphysical time. So right. to go back to what you said about the consciousness thing, so it seems to me that the only way that you get consciousness, or moral obligation, I'm sorry, moral obligation to support a conscious thing is if you assume that um, authority and purpose are somehow intrinsically tied into the universe, and there's some measure of these things, and that right. they correspond to something in reality. Whereas, from as far as I can tell, they don't. They're just imaginary concepts that we use to describe uh, relations like tall. Like tall doesn't exist yeah. as a fundamental part of reality. And just well, like you, well, just, well, just like you say that those can indicate theism, well, I can just use different concepts like spaghettiness or something and say there is a essence of spaghetti that is a fundamental part of the universe. And you can't have um, Spaghetti without this essence of spaghetti, therefore there is the pinnacle of spaghettiness, which is the spaghetti monster, and use the same kind mm -hmm. of an argument mm -hmm. to indicate that. So it seems mm -hmm. like you're just taking these um, abstract properties that exist as concepts in our heads and applying them to saying they are like platonic objects that exist right. in reality, and then using that to justify theism, which is exactly what, what I'm doing for naturalistic pantheism. I'm just, I can do the same yeah. thing. I, I, I guess I, I'm, I'm not sure that um, that's exactly what I'm doing. I mean, I think there, 
Certainly there are, are properties that require conscious agents in order to be instantiated, like thought, for example. You don't have thought without a thinker. Um, although Bertrand Russell at points seemed to think you could when his criticism of Descartes. Um, oh, I'm so interested in that, but... Yeah, I know. It's like, yeah, I don't know what to make of that. I, well, I, mean, I, I had a friend who is a philosopher who thought it was a really important point, and I just never could see it. But, but you know, be that what it may. I, I really want to just go on the side here just for a second. So my interpretation... Oh, yeah, let's do it. So my let's interpretation of the I think, therefore I am is circular is the argument that it's only circular because Descartes was trying to use it to indicate dualism, where he's trying to say that there is some substance of consciousness out there and that the right. I is the substance of consciousness. But if you right. just say I think, therefore I am without trying to argue for the dualism and say we could be material things, we could be dualistic things, right. we could be idealistic things, well, then it's not circular mm -hmm. anymore. Yeah, that might that might that might be I, 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 I don't think it's circular in any way, but I I think um, there there might be something to that. I, I think what happens with Descartes, okay, we'll get on a Descartes tangent because, you know, um, I really like Descartes, even though he makes all, kind, all kinds of mistakes. He's just so much fun, right? Um, I, I think what happens, the reason he, he, in meditation too, says, what am I? I'm a thinking thing is because he's taken the skeptic challenge so seriously. And he, and, you know, if, if you follow his train to meditation too, you already know that you're not a body, right? Or at least you have no grounds for a body You because you've eliminated everything you can doubt, which is all your sense experience and, and things like this. And then this, once he gets to the fact that he exists, then when he asks what he is, the only grounds he has is for a thinking thing. Now, should he have taken the skeptics challenge so seriously, right? I, I think he was... Well, there was a lot of games he was playing while he was doing this. I mean, there was a big resurgence of skepticism circulating at the time. And I think he thought, hey, not only can I overthrow Aristotle, but I can knock these skeptics off at the same time. And, and he said his thing accordingly. Anyways, it's just a fun, fun project. So anyway, right, we right. can, we well, can, just, here's just the big part. Right? Such an interesting <laughs> problem I've been working on. So if we grant, I grant that all, all the way, grant all the way down to, to the fact that we are a thinking thing, but right. we don't know what thinking things are. That's the thing. That's the part where I think that he jumped to a conclusion where it's circular. As I think, pretty sure Bertrand Russell argued it was circular in the way he argued this. Mm -hmm. But we can't know what thinking things are. We can know we're thinking things, but right. thinking things could be a material thing. They could mm -hmm. be a dualistic thing, which is a combination of both right. material and conscious right. things, or we could be just a pure idealistic right. kind of a thing. And so, as long right. as we don't say what the thinking thing is. Well, then it's totally mm -hmm. fine. That conclusion is completely justified. Right. And I don't think Russell would argue against that. I think Russell's only contention was with the fact that he jumped to the conclusion that this must be a kind of dualism, you know, a Cartesian well, dualism. Well, I wasn't thinking of that part of Russell. I was thinking where, when he said Descartes should not have said, I think. He should have said, there is thought, as if there could be thought without a thinker, right? right. I, I, so that's a different part of the Russell critique. Oh, right. Yeah, um, I totally agree. I think the, the I think is, yeah. it's just whatever we are is the doing the thinking. We're thinking yeah, thoughts are yeah, occurring. Exactly. Yeah. So, um, um, okay. Fun Descartes stuff. I have right, to be careful. So otherwise, was, we'll, we'll, go, we'll go all the way down the Descartes because there's a lot of things I'd love to say about Descartes. Yeah. So oh, I remember um, the term is reification. It's reification where you yes. apply. That's what I'm okay. accusing you of. I'm accusing you of reification okay. of taking right. um, uh, authority and purpose and applying these to as existing things in the universe like platonic mm -hmm. objects. Right. Yeah. I, and, and I didn't want to apply them to platonic objects. Right. Cause I, I think authority um, requires a consciousness, right. A tree doesn't have authority, right. It, you know, uh, a number doesn't have authority. A law of nature has no authority, right. Only, only uh, conscious agents can have authority. Right. And, um, and so, but I also think that, you can't have obligations without authority. And um, there can be, maybe there can be goods without authority, but you can't have obligations. And we've talked about that. So if there are objective moral obligations, it makes sense that there is a, uh, a conscious agent that has the kind of authority um, that grounds the obligations that are objective. So it's not some human authority. It's not government. It's not tradition. It's not culture because those are 
human things. Um, and, and so I'm not really reifying these things and turning them into platonic forms. Um, it's that um, what you need for moral obligation is, is this kind of authority. And then I made the further point that I, I think the, where it fits in with the story of God is that God's authority is in virtue of his creation, right? That, that he has that role and um, and he created us and, and the content of the obligations emerges out of the fact that he created us for his particular purposes, for us to, in, to embody certain virtues and reflect his goodness in certain ways and continue the creation project through cultivating the earth and this kind of stuff. That's all theological stuff. Right. So just going back to the authority thing, you said authority yeah. requires... Um... It can't be like a tree or something. It has to be yeah, conscious agent. Right. Mm -hmm. So I'm. So my question is: is why does authority? Why do you assume that authority has those constraints and it's not just like a bachelor, where it's just a made-up definition that humans have that really doesn't correspond to anything in reality? We can just change the definition however because, we want. Well, can you do that with authority? I mean, you can pretend. You can use the word in different ways and stipulate that by authority I mean a green tree frog, but you're not changing the concept of authority. Well, I, I would assume, like, for example, I can say gravity has authority over me and the fact that I can't fight against it. And that seems like an appropriate use of the term. It doesn't impose an obligation on you. Well, that, that is a further step. That's because you the way you interpret authority seems to yeah. entail consciousness, but the way I interpret authority doesn't. I don't see that there's an objectively correct, like, why would your interpretation be more correct than mine in this sense? Well, b because it's part of the concept of authority, right? So you think what gravity does is is describe the way um, objects with great mass ha exert causal influence right and and uh, so gravity doesn't really do anything it's like the objects right so the reason we stay close to the planet is because the planet is got a tremendous amount of mass and exerts a causal force on us right but causal causal forces is not it is a different concept than authority because the causal force happens no matter what. And authority is something that you can rebel against. At least this is how we use the term, right? And, and unless you think the, the term authority and the concept as it's, as it's emerged in all of these different cultures is a, is a misunderstanding of simple cause and effect, I think you've got to grant that it's, it's a real concept. Well, that's sort of what I'm arguing. I'm saying that we've come up with a definition of this thing that we use to describe right. what's going on in reality. But why do we assume that that definition actually corresponds to something that exists as opposed to just being a uh, phlogiston or something? Like we could say. Right. So that's essentially my argument. That why, is, why is the authority not like a phlogiston? We use it to describe mm -hmm. things in reality. But why should we believe it actually exists as a part of reality? It isn't just a made up term that we have. Well, for, for one thing, we believe object moral obligations exist and and objective moral obligations require authority oh i i don't grant that assumption and i don't think i mean many philosophers don't grant that assumption why why would sure. you say that they're wrong <laughs> they're wrong but i can say you're wrong so how does that well of course you can say that i'm wrong right so you think i have no obligation to refrain from torturing a three-year-old to death just for fun no, no no i'm saying i don't i'm saying you're wrong that oughtness requires authority so, so I'm rejecting that. How, how can you have moral obligation without some concept of authority playing an essential role? Well, there's lots of different versions of morality that don't have a authority in them. Most don't, I, I would assume. Moral obligation or just moral good? Um, I'm not familiar with that distinction as well, because to me, they seem to be like the same thing. Like most philosophers. I know. We, yeah, we went, we went over this. And, well, yeah, no, I mean, and I, I was mean, trying from to the, show from the perspective of, how they can come apart. Oh, right, right. But I mean, from the perspective of most philosophers, that doesn't seem to be a valid distinction. They don't really seem to make a di difference between those two. Most moral, most philosophers oh. are moral realists, but they still I, grant. No, no. That, I think that's false because most philosophers are very cognizant of the question, why be moral? Right. right. And, and the very question itself uh, assumes a distinction between moral goodness and moral obligation. Because we can recognize what it is to be moral, but it's still a legitimate question. Why right, should absolutely. we be moral? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. The part that they so the reject is the authority is part. widely understood. Right, but the, the authority part is the part that's being widely rejected. Like most philosophers are moral realists. I don't think but... it's being rejected, right? Um, I mean, there's got to be an example for. I mean, there's, well, wait a minute. 
that's not the sentence I wanted to say. I, I'm not sure if, if people are entertaining the notion of authority and rejecting it. I mean, a, a lot of people might reject it because they think, look, there is no being that has the appropriate authority to ground moral obligations. And, and if you assume that and bring that into your reasoning, then, of course, you're going to have to find another way to ground moral obligations. I just think those ways are not persuasive. Oh, yeah, it's absolutely. It's very hard to get obligation. So, so right. my, my understanding is, is that most of them don't think authority actually works to provide an oddness. It doesn't work any more than any, like me just saying, a natural law. Like there's, well, for the same reasons it, that a natural law can't ground objective oughtness, yeah. neither can an authority. Like the is-ought problem, the fact-value distinction. As far as we know, there is no way to bridge that gap. So for the same right, reasons. Right, but, go but ahead. to talk about God having authority is not moving from the is to the ought, right? Because intrinsic in the authority is the ought, that God ought to be obeyed. Well, I can just say the same thing. Intrinsic in the nature of pantheism is that it ought to be obeyed. The law that it has, the moral law ought to be obeyed. Well, but see, but all you get from pantheism is causal laws. Sure, right? but but I can just define it as but saying causal, causal laws don't have obligation. They just are description of things that happen. You don't. You never have to say, "Am I going to obey the law of gravity or not?" I don't know. I'm pretty rebellious today. I'm I'm a teenager. I hate authority. I have a bumper sticker question authority, and I'm not going to obey the law of gravity. You know that that doesn't work. But it's I can do the same thing different. you did, and I can just say it's an intrinsic part of the nature of naturalistic pantheism that it ought to be obeyed in this sense. But there is no there is no command. I mean, Kant makes the distinction that obligation only gets traction when there's a possibility of disobeying. This is in the groundwork. Right, but I totally reject that. I think that's an arbitrary distinction. Okay, well, good luck with that. <laughs> I mean, I don't know what else to say. I mean, this is a great discussion, so I really appreciate it. Yeah, I'm, I'm, loving, I'm, I'm totally not sure. Well, I, I think um, I'm going to start repeating myself, which is a sign of my uh, advanced age. And I, I don't want to just keep doing that. But OK, so we're, we're at a standstill on this one. Right. So I know we, we don't have a ton of time left. Right. But yeah. Oh, yeah, we do. We are, we are running out of time. You have a meeting, right? Yeah, I got to go. I'm doing an online class and I got to videotape some stuff. I'm on human content today. <laughs> so it'll be fun. Yeah. The is odd. I'm going to talk about the is odd stuff, which yeah. is which is fabulous. Yeah. All right. So then I'll just I guess I'll just uh, rephrase what my argument was and just have your final thoughts on it as a okay before we go. So my argument is again that you've applied these things like authority and purpose and saying that these are intrinsic in oughtness. Now, from my understanding, we have no solution to the what oughtness is. It's not a solved problem, and right. it could be the case that that is solved by an authority who isn't a being, but it is seems equally as plausible to me that it could be solved by an undiscovered natural law. Now, I see both right. are completely incoherent. Neither to me solve the problem, but it seems right. equally that we can assert both solve the problem. Mm -hmm. And so right. to me, from my perspective, both, if neither one solve the problem, then they both are equal evidence for either a theism or a natural pantheism. They can both be asserted to solve the problem, neither mm -hmm. actually solve the problem. So they're both equal evidence, which is just none. From my okay, fair enough. So my response is they're not equal at solving the problem because of the distinction between natural laws that that are causal and and moral obligations that an agent can choose to obey or not obey. Right. So that's one distinction. And um, and so that if there are objective moral obligations, which most people think there are, then then that at least provides evidence that the theistic theory is better than the naturalistic theory, the naturalistic pantheism. Right, so that's one line of evidence. But can't right. we just keep the moral oughtness and change the definition and take out the authority? Like, why, why is that a problem? Well, you have to do some work and analyze oughtness and see if, if, if you can get oughtness out of F equals MA, right? Some natural law. And it just, it, it, it seems already clear that, that that's not the case. Right? So it's not like a we don't know if it can work. We already know it can't work. But from the perspective of many other philosophers, it seems that the authority thing also doesn't work for the same reasons. Well, not for the same reason. So some people will will deny that that even if God exists, he has that authority. We could argue about that. Some people will say, well, because there's no God, no one has that authority. And I would argue that they're right. If there's no God, then no one has the authority to prescribe objective moral obligations. You could have you could have 
relative moral obligations. Like I have a moral obligation to drive on the right-hand side of the road because uh, there's a legitimate authority in the state that made those rules and the rules are arbitrary, but they have to do with safety. And, you know, you can see how you could get, get local or relativistic obligations, but to get objective moral obligations, um, you, you aren't going to get that without someone standing outside of the whole human endeavor um, to do that. But like I said, I'm just going to assert this, right? Like I said, I think it has to be a conscious agent. Yeah, but because my argument was, is, is there evidence? Is there a best conclusion here? And can't I just assert the alternative? And is there a way to differentiate some kind of way that we can show one of these is real and one of them isn't imaginary or one of them is imaginary well, and is real? Well, what I can show is that your alternative isn't as good because it can't ground obligation. Mine can ground obligation. Now, that doesn't solve the whole case, right? It just means this is evidence that raises the likelihood of theism over the naturalistic pantheism. Right, but it can only Obvious. not it can only not account for oughtness given your definition of oughtness. If I change well, my definition, you haven't given another one, right? Well, you know, let's well, so, do yeah, the work. So my, my oughtness exists without authority, so it can account for oughtness under my view. You haven't made a plausible story about oughtness without authority. Why well, I, I, you haven't made a plausible? You appeal uh, to causal laws, right? No, right. I'm talking about the concept of authority, uh, oughtness. Well, you have to my, show that the concept, concept actually... of, of oughtness is completely plausible. Sure, but the <laughs> concept, you have to show that your concept actually corresponds to reality. It isn't just like a made-up right. figment of well, language. Well, if objective moral obligations are part of reality, and we think they are, we agree, sure, and the yeah. best concept requires authority, then authority is real. So I, 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 think I've, I, I think I've made a good case here. Obviously, we're not going to be able to finish the story, right? Right. right. And, I, did, uh, I don't and, disagree, but it's really interesting. It's a really interesting conversation. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Thanks for coming on. I really appreciate you taking the time. No to problem. I appreciate what you're doing. I'm glad you're doing this. I, let, I have to tell you a little story. I, I searched through some of the local colleges looking for an atheist club. Yeah. Couldn't find one. Long Beach State, Cal State, Fullerton, some of the junior colleges. And I thought, come on, atheists, get to, let, at least let's get on the ball. So, you know, keep doing what you're doing. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Um, have good luck with your meeting. I'll talk All right. to you later. Thank you so much. Have a nice day. All right. We'll see you. Bye.